We hmm. are supposedly live. Maybe. We have had, if this is, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to tell you right now, if this is sounding weird, if this is looking weird. looking weird, if there's anything weird about this, it's because we've had what I would consider to be a relatively major catastrophe here, like two seconds before I was, we were, well, not two seconds, about 30 minutes before we were supposed to go live. Can we just get a yes, you are, your audio's coming through. Are you hearing any problems? Are you seeing any issues? It looks like it's okay on my screen, but I just had to do a whole lot of stuff. All looks and sounds good Kevin, yeah, from Kevin. Kevin. Okay, all good, working, working, sounds good. Thank you so much. So let Phew. me explain right off the bat. It doesn't look completely good because these tanks behind us are supposed to be green. <laughs> I don't know what's what's going on there, but that's so a weird color. It's a very that's happened before. <clears throat> so let me explain real fast. What happened is I do my normal thing. I get up here and I'm getting all the live stream stuff set up, and the software that we use, they updated it yesterday. Today's the third. What is today? I don't even know what it is. Yeah. So yesterday they updated this software and the the computer that I normally use, it's a Mac that I normally use. It's a really old one, but it does adequately for live streams. Well, apparently when they updated the streaming software, it no longer supports the version of the, the Mac that I have, the software. So I tried to update that Mac, but it's as updated as it will allow me to be. That meant I had to go get the other Mac from the other room that is relatively new, bring it in here, reconnect everything. But I've never downloaded my streaming software on that Mac before. So eight minutes before, you know, eight minutes ago, I'm trying to figure out all the settings I once had. Now, I haven't had to mess with the settings and set up the actual live stream software in probably, well, since we started, I mean, however long ago that was. Um, so... Yeah, I just went through in about eight minutes, and Whip says, "I see your problem. It's a Mac." Yeah, it, it, well, normally it <laughs> runs one. great. I mean, it, it's fine, but like I, I literally had to do all the audio, all the setup, all the connections, all the video, rehook up all the stuff in about eight minutes, and things are definitely not one hundred percent right because, like I said, the tanks behind us look gray, and there's a color the, that well, we're gonna yeah the, the green the green is not coming through in it's pretty weird it's so weird i don't know what's going on there well i'm gonna have to fix that but i'm not worried about that tonight i'm just happy that you can hear us i'm happy that you can see us and if there's any weird things that happen just <laughs> let us know like hey this is a weird thing that's normally not the case in your other live streams and we'll try to fix that i'll, I'll mess with things as we go so that is, um, that's the thing. Chase wants to know where we got our shirts. We're going to talk about that momentarily. Don't you worry. Uh, we will discuss the shirt situation right here and right here. There. This one's better. No, this one's better. This one's better. This one's way better. So yeah, we're going to discuss that momentarily. But first, I want to just kind of go over uh, all the things that have been happening this week. So. If you recall, a couple weeks ago, we went to St. Louis. And we went to St. Louis, and I did the talk there. But while I was there, it was pretty awesome because we got to do some fish room and some fish store tours. And one of the fish rooms that we toured was Melanie Holmes, and she is an awesome aquascaper. And she's got her own theme. She's got her own style. And a lot it's of amazing. that revolves around biotope, like South American, Asian biotopes, and black water aquariums. And we had the privilege of going to her home and filming those tanks. And so if for some reason you haven't seen that video that came out on Sunday, that was the fish room tour of her fish room. And it was really exciting. When I, you know, as soon as I walked in, the minute I walked in and I looked at the first tank, the, the Congo yeah. Tetra tank, and I'm just mm. like... I got to get the camera out. Uh, it was it was that awesome. So I was really, really happy to film that. And then today on the small scape, you kind of did a follow-up with your own little twist, right? Well, it wasn't really a follow-up because well, I, follow yeah. I would have done mine regardless, but I do mine differently. We see things differently. So yeah, you, you got my take and seven takeaways that I got from her fish room. One of them, actually two of them blew my mind. 
two of them blew my mind. One specifically that I was like knocking that one off right away. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, that was pretty cool. Yeah. So you did that yeah. today on the Smallscape on your channel. Uh, tomorrow we've got the members video coming out, and then Sunday I haven't. I've got a lot of footage now. I've got so many cool things that I want to share with you, and there are some species profiles where I've got great footage. I've got about four or five of those backed up now where I, I, I really want to get those out. I have yet another fish room tour that I could be doing. I have at least one more fish store tour and I have a bunch of subjects that I think we want to talk about too because it's been a little while since we've done some of the stuff that you and I usually do. So I'm not exactly sure which video I'm going to put together for all that just yet, but something will be out on Sunday. That's all I can say <laughs> about that. Um, places places we are going to be where are we going to be next it's the big one aquashella dallas Aquashella dallas be there be yep. square that's coming up it's hard to believe but that is may the 20th and that is wow that's right around the corner it's just over two weeks away so i'm just curious for all you people who are here hanging out who's going is anybody going to aquashella dallas uh hang out do all the crazy awesome things that we do at Aquashella Dallas. So I am definitely looking forward to that. It's kind of weird. This is the first year since they've, st well, maybe not the first year, but it's been the first year in a while where we haven't had three yeah. Aquashellas to go to in a year yeah. because normally you've got Dallas, Chicago, and Orlando. This time we just have Dallas and Daytona because they moved it out of Orlando, but no Chicago. So we have one less we have one less Aquashella to go to this year, and that's kind of crazy. So, uh, yeah, so that's coming up two and a half weeks from now. I see some people, they're going, man. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Emma's going Aquashella Dallas with VIP. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, if you are considering any of the Aquashellas this year, I, I, would, I would highly recommend the VIP pass because the VIP pass gets you both days, Saturday and Sunday. So if you're, especially if you're traveling to the area, it's nice to be able to go both days and see all the things and see all the speakers for both days. Uh, I will be speaking on Sunday. I believe my time slot is now one o'clock. I think that may have changed. I don't know because I thought the last time I looked, I was earlier in the day, but I am as of right now, 1 p.m. on Sunday. Topic to be announced relatively soon. So uh, that's when I'm speaking. I think John KG Tropicals is on Saturday. I don't know. I, I didn't memorize all the speakers. I think Zenzo Tozawa Tanks is going to be there. I can't remember if he's, I think he might be Saturday. I don't remember now. I don't remember, I don't remember which day he is. Uh, so, and there'll be a bunch of others as well. But the VIP pass, it gets you the two days. It gets you in earlier at, what is it, 10 a.m.? I believe the VIP starts at 10 a.m. Yeah. I think. Don't totally don't quote remember. me on that. But that gets you in an hour earlier than the early bird, which I believe is 11 a.m. And then general admission on Saturday, I believe, is 1 p.m. And I think Sunday they move it up to noon because it, the thing closes, I think, at 6 p.m. I really should be looking this stuff up instead of just shouting out a bunch of times if I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Emma, thank you so much for con Emma, just confirm for me all these, these times that I'm going off of memory from years past. Um, I believe on Saturday it closes at 6 p.m. and Sunday 5 p.m. And so that's why the general admission is 1 p.m. on Saturdays and then they move it up to noon on Sundays. So that's the schedule. But then as part of the VIP, you get in a lot earlier. And I also am nearly 100% sure that we are doing the Friday night VIP meet and greet where the creators will be there. And there's usually like some kind of a dinner -y kind of thing, light dinner sort of thing. Yeah. At least that's what it's been the last couple times. I don't know what it's going to be this time, but that happens Friday night. And then we have the donuts and coffee in the morning for all the VIPs. So they get there and they, they can have their coffee. I don't drink coffee, but for coffee drinkers, I'm sure that's a big deal. But I am a donut eater and that is a big deal. As long as there's <laughs> at least one jelly donut in there. Then you're okay. I'm a happy guy. Yeah. So yeah, that's so that's that's the VIP situation, and that's the way it is for Dallas, and I'm sure that's the way it's going to be for Daytona because that's what they've been doing uh, since the beginning of time. I also believe that you get some kind of a. It used to be you get a shirt, right? They just had a shirt that yeah. you would get, and I think they switched that where you get a like a merch um, 
gift card voucher. That's, voucher. The, that's the word I was looking for, a voucher. So then you can pick out your own shirt, I suppose, or sweatshirt or whatever else you find interesting at the little booth that they have. So I'm getting mine as soon as we get there because they keep yeah, running the out. Couple they couple times. They run out. We, yeah, we get in there and we wait and then boom, they're gone. So going to be a lot of vendors, a lot of vendors. There's going to be, so people always ask, you know, what, if you've never been there, what can you expect? I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen the videos by now, but there are obviously a lot of manufacturer type people there. You've got like the uh, CHA, you know, like the filter makers and light people and stuff. And then, you know, demonstrating their products. But there's a lot of local vendors there as well. And so if you're looking for uh, driftwood, if you're looking for plants, if you're looking for shrimp, if you're looking for fish, uh, certainly that is a place you could go to find those things as well as all the entertainment stuff that's going on uh, at that time as well so a lot to do and it's a lot of now, now the other thing I will say is if you are someone who is maybe like I'm not a huge fan of really large crowds the other and second floor aquatics lots of people yes <laughs> you're reading my mind so if you're not a fan of really large crowds then it's probably more beneficial either to get there in the morning do some looking around and then be like okay it's getting crowded in here by like noon or one o'clock and then you can always come back later in the afternoon and especially on sunday all right so sundays tend yeah. to be much there, there tends to be f fewer people on sundays than there are on saturdays especially once it gets to be like one two o'clock in the afternoon and so if you want to see the things then that might be an option for you if you kind of get overwhelmed by by humanity and all the people that are there so that is indeed the story. Melanie's here. What's up? What's Melanie! Up? Just <laughs> talking about you and your awesome fish room. That's right. We can't help it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and by the way, thanks to all the moderators. I see Whip's here. Dave is here. Um, the second floor. And is Wendy here? I, I thought maybe I saw Wendy at some point mm, pop in. I don't remember unless I'm just making stuff up as I go. Um, Mike asks if we're going to the Canadian Aquatic Expo near Toronto in September. That would be fun sometime. Uh, Don't you think? Didn't it would know be it existed, but <laughs> I think that would require me to get a passport. Oh, Canada! <laughs> I'd have to be all grown up and yeah. be like, put on Hi, our maple a, leaf merch. I have a passport. Yeah, and just be like, and you got to get that ID, the real ID or whatever. Well, it's I already called. have that. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I didn't. Want to I did go that the last long time. line. Yep. Well, it's not. You can. It. it they got it pretty efficient now, so I have the real ID. So good and passport. For you. Then I'll, I'll have to get one. So anyway, no, we're not going because I didn't know it was a thing. But one of the things I've always really wanted. So if if I could just wish some things. Uh, by the way, Corey and I from Aquarium Co-op, we worked out a thing. He, he texted me today. He's like, "Hey, let's do the live stream connection thing." And I just saw Aquarium Co-op. Uh, and their viewers just might have come on over and uh, hanging out. Thanks for being here. That's pretty. That's pretty awesome. Hope you've been having a wonderful evening. Enjoy uh, our weird yeah. lighting. So that was enjoy <laughs> our weird. Yeah, normally this is a great time for, if you've never been here before to join because I was just explaining to everybody about thirty minutes before the live stream. All of my live stream stuff was a complete disaster. I had to switch out computers. This back here is normally green, as you might expect an aquarium to look when it's planted. Yeah. I gotta fix that situation, and I'll fix it for next week because, you know, eight minutes before the live stream, I'm still trying to figure out what were my old settings on my on my software, uh, which we do it like once every four years. You forget. For, you forget these things. So there's that. Uh, so anyway, yeah, back to uh, Aquashello. So remember what I was saying. Was I over with that? What was was my? I think I was done with the whole Aquashella thing. I think you're done with your spiel. Okay. I don't know. So, hmm. sorry. I don't listen sometimes. The other thing I was doing right before the live stream is I was sucking down my dinner <laughs> while <laughs> trying to get the the live stream That's thing. That's impressive. Yeah, all set up. So I was eating mashed potatoes, setting up the live stream, trying to find our shirts, and then yeah, here we are. So, uh, yeah, one of the things that we wanted to announce tonight is a lot of you have been asking, what's the deal with Ovaltine? What's that from? I think I've already used that one a couple times, but y'all should pretty much have that by now. Uh, but anyway, you're asking about the shirts, right? So Joanna is the creative one, and <laughs> she decided, we promised you a, a while back that we were going to have some new things going on. And, and I warned you, they were a little on the weird and quirky side. Weird. Yeah, and so That's these me. aren't necessarily um, like channel branded as much although i think you kind of snuck it did you sneak it at all i did this one it's the, the shrimp wrangler <laughs> is 
the small scape. It's got a real oh, small, the right, small scape, and then we put here? we put Primetime Aquatics on the fish wrangler. Yeah, so um, these are now on the website, and they are brand spanking new. This <laughs> is the first time. I, I'm hoping I didn't leave a sticker. Have you ever done that where you, you go to the store, like, this is a great shirt, and then you get home, like, I'm going to wear it right away, and you forget, like, the size sticker or something that's still on there or a tag, and you're walking around thinking you're all cool in your snazzy new shirt, and you're like, hey, everybody, you, you like my new shirt? You know what I've done? I've walked around a shirt with stickers that were put on my shirt, unbeknownst to me. But beknownst to me, that's happened. And then, so, and then there's a third one. I would wear this one, too. Oh, yeah, sorry, there's a third one. This <laughs> one forgot. is near, besides this one, I just love him because he's got such a cute little face. I just love the shirt. But um, this one is near and dear to my heart because... And you're not going to be able to see it because there is apparently no green, not enough green. So you're not going to see it. So you have oh, to yeah. go on the nice website to that. just look at it. Yeah, nice night for that, right? <laughs> this is so you silly. Can, that's, I'm looking leaves here. Right here. There yeah, are literally they're big, like lime bright, green, bright green leaves lime, over here. And you can't see them. And you can't see them because and that my looks stupid weird. camera. But anyways, I'm going to paint the picture for you. It's Anubius with googly eyes and smiling. And he's hugging a rock. <laughs> and it says, stuck on you. PrimetimeAquatics.com. The shirts are there now, all the different <laughs> sizes. There you go. Uh, You've been warned. The dubious that you can't see <laughs> stuck to that rock is, I promise it's there. It's like there. a magic trick. Magic. Boom, there it is all of a sudden. Um, again, good. thank you all the people who came over from the Aquarium Co-op live stream. Glad you're here. I thought that was pretty cool when you started doing that. I noticed that it was about a month, six weeks ago or so, where I'm like, oh, that's cool. Now we've got like a, a Wednesday lineup going on over yeah. here. That's, that's pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, so... PrimetimeAquatics.com, you got the fish wrangler, if that's you, or maybe you like shrimp. Show off the shirt one more time. And Why is the green coming through on that shirt? I don't know, because this is a this is called so military weird. greens, for those of you who wanted a shirt other than black. Oh, yeah, we get asked that all the time. Yes. Shrimp wrangler, yep. professional shrimp wrangler. Oh, my gosh, And yeah. you're an authentic fish wrangler. And what would you rather be, professional or authentic? I'd rather be a shrimp wrangler. Okay, <laughs> so there you have it. Um, so couple things um if so tonight is it's all about i don't have like a subject or anything like that for us to explore but if you've got questions what we usually do especially for those of you who are just coming over for the first time if you put the at prime time aquatics in somewhere in your question that highlights it for us we know it's a question makes it a little bit easier for us to answer uh which is pretty cool kevin by the way thank you so much for being a member the last three months can you invoice for the three new shirts in large <laughs> Go on the website. Website, man. Go on they're the website. All, they're all there. Asked, are we going to bring them to Dallas? That's the plan. All right, that was the plan. Uh, hopefully we have shirts left <laughs> that we can bring to Dallas. But yeah, we you for those who have been to Aquashella and stopped by before, you know that our, our table's usually filled with active wear. Active wear for you fish you fish keepers. Guess what Melanie said. What did Melanie Mil say? Military green is her favorite color. Well, how about that? Welcome to the green club. Mint yep. green is my favorite. But and then you I can sneak up green. on all your fish and be like, <gasps> right? Like, I didn't no. see me coming because I was in military green. I blended in with everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jonathan says, I'd like to get a pair of geophagus top hosts, but I've been reading some people say 55-gallon minimum. Some info says 75-gallon minimum. What do you think? I think that, so I'm in the camp of the probably, well, let's back up. Depends on how many you want. If you just want one, I'm in the camp that a 40-gallon breeder would work just fine. Because, by the way, for those of you who don't know, a 40-gallon breeder is actually 47 gallons. So when you actually do all the math, it's not, they lied to us. I guess 47-gallon breeder would be a lot to say. So uh, a single one could definitely be a centerpiece fish in a 40-gallon breeder. 55 is fine. I had actually two pairs and a 55 gallon and that worked out for years the nice thing about the geophagus topos is they're not as large they don't get as large as a lot of the other geophagus so like your altifrons your wine milleri your megasema uh your cyrnomensis those ones tend to get they, you know they can get eight nine inches maybe even a little larger if you you know you count the fin trailers and all that stuff those definitely you're looking at a minimum i think of a 75 but really a six foot tank is even better however the top of host, you know, the males are only going to max out at around five-ish, five and a half inches or so, and they're not overly aggressive. Like I said, we had a couple pairs in a 55-gallon, and that four-foot space was enough for them to both have both pairs breeding, and they lived a nice long time. So, yeah, I think you could do that. Now, if you wanted to keep, 
I, I probably lucked out in the fact that I had four of them in one tank and it got along okay. And part of that might have been that I did have some structure in that tank which broke up line of sight and they grew up from a very small size. They grew up together. That sometimes can help as well. But to be on the safe side, if you have them in a 55 gallon, maybe you only do a couple of them. Now you could potentially have a problem, right? If you have two males and they decide, you know what? we can't share this space, then just know, like with all cichlids, I think for a lot of people who keep cichlids, that the big thing is have a backup plan, right? If, if something is not working, what are you going to do? Can you move the fish to a separate tank? Do you have to bring it back to the pet store? Do you have buddies who have a bunch of tanks, right? What's your backup plan when you're keeping cichlids when you mix and, and mix them together and then if something goes wrong, you can deal with it. So, and by the way, we had, and it's too far up there, we had another member join earlier in the stream. Thank you for that. All right, let's see. Ooh, all right, we got lots of questions. I'm liking it. Mark says, fighting blue-green algae. Sweet. Did all the normal <laughs> things. Uh, want to try hydrogen peroxide. Thoughts, ideas. Does uh, dosing for 29 gallon. So, I mean, yeah, it's an option. Hydrogen peroxide is an option. When you say did all the normal things, uh, what do what those normal things entail? So to me, they entail the following. I'm controlling my lights, right? And so when I say controlling lights, that means I'm controlling light duration and I'm controlling light intensity if that's possible. Not all lights allow you to do that. So light duration, am I keeping it, you know, if this is a planted tank, am I keeping it around eight, nine hours? Um, or are you keeping the lights on for 11, 12, 13, 14 hours. Uh, that could be a problem, right? Light intensity. If you're using a light that would allow you to dim it a little bit more, like some of the, I mean, not all lights allow you to do that, but if you've got one that where you can click it and it kind of brings it down a little bit, that might help as well, provided that you don't have highlight plants, right? So maybe it's something where if you've got a planted tank, it's like, well, I've got Anubias, I've got Crips, I've got Jungle Bell. Well, that doesn't need like screaming bright lights. Uh, Obviously water, and so you're keeping an eye on your water parameters, and that means no ammonia, no nitrite. And then if you've got a problem with blue-green algae, then you're worried about your nitrate. And it, we focus on nitrate because that's the thing that's easiest to measure, right? There could be other things going on. They're like, well, what about my phosphates? Yeah, but that's not as easy to measure. Normally, if you've got your nitrates in check, the other things are probably going to be okay as well. And so maybe now what you're looking at is keeping your nitrates Try it even with a planet tank with a blue green algae problem, are they around 20 parts per million or less? But I wouldn't go much below like 10 or 15 in a planted tank. That may mean if you've been dosing liquid fertilizers, you cut back a little bit just to make sure that you're you're not going way over. Then the other option too is do you have things in the tank that can consume the algae? Right. And so um depending on the size of the tank, we use anything from a mono shrimp to uh, clown plecos and you know 10 gallons and above you got your bristle nose plecos so there's there's options there as well i see Corey's here what's up sorry about that i led my live stream here but forgot to tell people well you must have told uh, some people man because we had a lot of people say hey we're here from aquarium co-op so thanks uh, appreciate it glad you're here i'm sure it's been a long day you know you can just relax i can't and, imagine now you don't have to do any talking how about that that's pretty <laughs> exciting and by the way, I wish you were going to be at Aquashella. That's oh, always, yeah, not it's fun. Be, huh? not, not, not that I know of, unless you're going to sneak in. Are you going to make a sneak in the surprise appearance? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, uh, let's see. Hip Hop says, best way to put in rescape a carpet of dwarf Sagittaria. Want to tear down and rescape, but don't want to lose my carpet of dwarf sag. Pull individually or scoop like turf another way. Now, we don't keep carpeting plants. Do you have any suggestions? or? I, I don't keep uh, carpeting plants, so I would definitely not be the the best person to yeah. talk but you're going to need you're going to need like you're going to need CO2. I mean, well, the one well, this is about a rescape, so he's successful with it already. Um, if you're going to be redoing the substrate, then you're going to have to tear it out anyway. So how that happens, I don't know. <laughs> but if you're redoing substrate, now if you're just redoing some rocks and some wood, maybe you can leave as much in there as you possibly can. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, what about green hair algae? I've been fighting it for over a year. I've tried everything. So everything I just said, depending on the size of the tank and depending on the inhabitants, I'm looking at two two organisms that really do a number on green hair algae. One is a mono shrimp. So here's a crazy thing. 
at one point I had brought in, in one of my orders, I brought in like three or 400 of mono shrimp and I, I just stuck them all in a couple 10 gallon tanks. It was a quarantine tank. Uh, these were gonna go back out after four weeks. But what was so cool is I had this Java moss and I mean, it was just covered in green hair algae. So I would take clumps of this Java moss out chuck it in the amano shrimp tank and now granted there were a lot of them not suggesting throw up you know 200 in a 10 gallon tank that's not what i'm saying but because there were so many they wiped out that green hair algae like every two days i kept throwing java moss and then they would just leave this what wound up being some really gnarly looking java moss because it was covered in green hair algae but then yeah, it all recuperated so, sad. so the point is if you've got like nano fish and you've got fish that aren't going to eat shrimp a mono shrimp can definitely do a number on green hair algae. And so if I had like a 20 gallon tank, you could easily start out with eight to 10. If you've got fish that will eat shrimp, then you could look at the Florida flag fish, understanding that that can be somewhat of a fin nipper. So if you've got guppies in there or you've got veil tail angels, maybe that's not the best option. But if you've just got, I don't know, standard tetras and barbs and things like that, then the Florida flagfish can also eat green hair algae. That's why I have them in two tanks. I've got them in my top 75 with my Kessel lights because that was putting on a fair amount of light. And because of that, then the Florida flagfish were eating all that green hair algae off the jungle valve, the rocks in the wood. And then I put a couple, another, I think it was two pairs in our 125 Lake Tanganyikan tank. I know, weird mix, Florida flagfish in with Lake Tanganyikan cichlids, but they started consuming a lot of the green hair algae there too. My suggestion would be try to get as much of it out at first as possible, right? Because usually that stuff, you know, you let it go for a week if it's a really bad problem. You could be like pulling out giant clumps, right? I'm assuming that's kind of the battle you're facing. And then the nice thing about that is you pull that giant clump out and then, you know, your hand stinks and all that stuff. But when you pull out most of it and then you add those fish, you add the shrimp, they often are able to keep up. Right, but you want to do those other things in addition to that as well. I had sailfin mollies eat the heck out of green hair algae, although then I had black mollies and they didn't do it at first, but then I think they started catching on because there was a significant amount of food competition and they started eating it as well. All right, Gio wants to know what's the best carpeting plant or the easiest carpeting plant for uh, sand? And I don't generally do carpeting plants because I don't run high light and I don't do CO2, which like... Uh, um, dwarf hair grass is going to like both of those. I think you can probably get away with uh, no CO2. Sometimes if, you're high, if your light is high enough, but it's, it's not going to grow in carpet as fast. But I personally like Microsword. And actually in some tanks, you can get away with Valsneria. It'll stay short um, and it will, it, Val grows very, very quickly. So that's yeah. kind of a really cheap and easy way to to do it. Yeah, we've got that situation going on in at least three or four tanks where our jungle bell only gets about this tall. And I think it's because those tanks are probably have lights that are fairly strong. Yeah. And so it's not growing as tall, but it gets about that tall. Carpets the entire bottom. It's kind of cool. It's not quite, you know, the same same look, especially if you've got a smaller no. tank because the leaves are going to be thicker than let's say like a dwarf hair grass or something, but it's still pretty cool. BC, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. As an adult, what is the largest single fish for a 55 gallon? That's a great question. I believe, did we do, have we gotten to the 55 gallon centerpiece fish? Did, is that the last one we did? Because we, we, we did a video series. Um, We're in the middle of a video series that was centerpiece fish for certain size tanks. So Joanna is going to look it up real fast. I think we did one. I think where we left off, it might have been 40 though. I Maybe we haven't quite gotten there yet. Let's see. So a 55 gallon, the, the, the issue really is, I mean, you got a four yeah, foot tank. centerpiece fish. Okay, so mm -hmm. yeah, we did do a 55 gallon centerpiece fish. That will definitely give you the answers you're looking for. However, generally speaking, for a 55, because it's more narrow, right? It's only 12 and a half inches front to back. The Geophagus top host that we mentioned earlier, I love that fish. A single one for a 55 gallon looks absolutely like outstanding. I actually have, it's not a single one, but uh, Pearl Garami, I've got a group in a 55 gallon. They get along fine in a group. I've got both the gold and the standards. So that would be an option. So that's about a four, four and a half inch fish. The Geophagus top host is around five to five and a half inches. I don't think I would go much over in a 55 
for a centerpiece much over six inches. So you got your Geophagus Topos. That means you've got your Electric Blue Akara. A single one would look pretty cool there, although you could potentially add more than one, uh, depending on if you know if you get them small. We've always had good luck keeping those together. Uh, 55 gallon, you can do an angelfish. It's a nice, nice tall tank. Um, what else would I do? You've got the Curvicep cichlids, the keyhole cichlids, uh, Nanochromus luteus, which is kind of like, uh, not Nanochromus, uh, Cryptoheros nanoluteus, sorry. Cryptoheros nanoluteus. Is, they, all, they often call them the yellow convict, but they don't, they don't look like convicts. They're more yellow. They got these really pretty blue eyes. They're really pretty fish. Dig a little bit more than anything else I've talked about so far, but they're really pretty. Uh, what else? I think that's a pretty good start, but that you get the idea around the size. You know, I I don't I wouldn't go much over like five and a half six inches for a centerpiece in a fifty five. Um, oh, and whoever is uh, has come in recently, yes, our lighting is off because of a <laughs> um, massive computer issue that's yeah not fixed yet. So basically, <laughs> the quick quick version for those of you who showed up later, like what's going on with the tanks? Those are the ugliest fish tanks I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, yes, they are because there's absolutely no green going on there, and I. Apparently we're we're looking like we're a little tan. That's kind of cool, you know. Yeah, right. I had to switch out. I have one Mac for live streams, one Mac that does all my video editing. The lab, the the Mac for live streams wouldn't. It was an older one. It wouldn't update to the correct version for my streaming software that just got updated yesterday. Apparently, had to switch out the computers, which means I had to download all my software on this new computer, and with. Eight minutes left before the start of the live stream, I had to try to remember all the audio and video presets that I had that I set up like five years ago. And so this was the best I could do eight minutes before the stream, man. This was, this was it. So I'm just happy you can hear us, that you can see us, and that we're not right. having any major other major issues. So far, the worst case is these tanks look completely ugly because they're not green. I'll try to fix that next week and then the shirt you held up all the green was gone it was almost like th Weird. there's some green filter going on that i have to fix and i will fix that for next week kevin thank you so much for gifting five prime time aquatics Aww, memberships that's, that's so pretty nice. cool really appreciate that and so who was the lucky ones charles jonathan nathan and amanda that's really cool and chase appreciate that really appreciate it and thank amanda. you nice yep very nice all right, this thing is now jumping around all over the place for me. Community tanks, thank you so much for the super chat. New pair of epistles will only eat live baby brine and live blackworms. How do I transition them to eat flake and pellet foods? Th that's common. All right, so first of all, that, that will happen, especially because as people are growing up epistles, they pretty much will eat live baby brine right from the start, and then you're giving them the blackworms as well. There's a couple different ways to do this. All right. For some people, it's just like, well, I cut them off. I cut them off of the black worms. I cut them off of the live baby brine and they get fish food and they either eat it or they're going to get hungry. And usually after a few days, they start to figure it out. Believe it or not, this process is actually easier if you have other fish in the tank that are eating whatever fish foods you normally add to your tanks. So I have found that a lot of fish who are like, there's this stuff floating around in the water, man. It's freaking me out. It's definitely not moving, and it's not something I usually like, consume. But for some reason, when they see other fish going crazy for it, they start to consume it. So if you've got other fish in the tank, that will help. A lot of people worry that if their fish don't eat after a day or two or three that they're going to die. Now, if your fish have been well-fed, and it sounds like they have been, you've been giving them live black worms and live baby brine for a while, so I'm sure their bellies are nice and full. If you're like, you know what? it's time, it's time to switch over then start feeding them some other types of foods. Uh, one of the things that you can do that most fish will do, if, if you're trying to just convert initially from live, maybe to frozen, is you could, the fish are probably still fairly small if they're still eating live baby brine, but if you wanted to chop up some frozen blood worms and see if they'll eat that, a lot of fish will eat that. So that gets them off the live black worms because that's kind of a pain, right? I mean, if you're culturing them, maybe not, but um, it is kind of a pain to feed those. Live baby brine is really easy, but eventually they're going to get big enough where they're like, this isn't worth going after. What I do, and my method is a little bit different. Are my methods unsound? Don't say anything. I don't see any method at all, sir. Who's got the movie? All right. Not me. So anyway, my philosophy is we bring in at this point 
every four to six weeks, we're bringing in thousands of fish. They're getting the flake foods that I feed and the sinking pellets. They got to eat it, right? Now, now be, that being said, I am not purposely bringing in fish that I know have a history of only eating live foods, and epistos don't. Epistos, generally speaking, almost always convert fairly well to to life, I'm sorry, to prepare foods. Unless they were wild caught, then it might take a little bit longer. But I just chuck it in there. And yeah, for, you know, I feed light at first because I don't want just a bunch of food sinking to the bottom and then it rots. And it's like, well, that didn't solve anything. But it goes in and they learn to eat it. And again, it, had, it does help if there's other fish in there eaten as well. Silver Creek, Demolition Man. I love the guest. That's a great movie. It's It's wrong, but... It was a <laughs> demolition man. No, demolition man. The quote would be, "Illuminate, deluminate." That was an MDK. But I don't <laughs> want to repeat that on the no. YouTube thing because then apocalypse whip. You got it. Whip got apocalypse. It. Apocalypse, apocalypse now. It oh, was the why would movie. you think I would even know that? Because you've seen that movie, right? Only if you made me watch it. And I guarantee I didn't I really probably, even watch well, I'm it. Sure I did make you watch it. Now, well, see, Mackenzie, thank you so much for the super chat. How long do Anubius grabby roots take to grab on? I glue them, and every time I'm vacuuming, I bump the rock, off they float. Oh. Fellow Anubius lover. Oh, <laughs> yay. So how, how long is it? How long is the grabbiness? How long does it know. take? It really depends. I think it depends on the type of Anubius, too. Some of them are grabbier than others. And it probably depends if they're ever getting bumped. Which, from your fish, from your, oh, from yeah. your you get snails, uh, from cleaning, you know, it just uh, flow too. But um, how long? Yeah, I, I don't know if I could really answer that. It, I mean, their leaves grow really, really slow, so I don't doubt that their grabbiness is slow as well. But once they get grabby, they will be very grabby. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had Nubius where I'm like, oh my gosh, i got to try to disconnect this from rocks and yeah. without breaking the stems. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say if it were... My personal guess, six to eight weeks at least, right before they're and, and I think they would grab wood a lot, a little bit faster than they would grab the rocks. Probably. He doesn't know how to use the three seashells. You've been fined one credit for the <laughs> verbal immoralities. <laughs> okay, wait. I have to. I have to read a fun story. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Whoever is a history buff, you're gonna love this. All right, John Wood. I think you're in the in the uh, chat. If if not, anyways. Um, all right, so this is a comment from today, and I thought it was so cool. I said, I'm going to bring this up tonight because it's really cool. All right. He says, I got, a he I got a heck of a story for you, Farmer Joe. That's what he calls me. Um, I did a vegetable talk at the local church about a week ago. Anyways, yesterday the minister had me meet them at the cemetery to see if I can help them get grass growing on some graves. Figured out the problem. It's going to take a little bit. Wait, it's gonna, this, is get, this gets good. Got to do some soil correcting, but anyway, turns out two sections over is the grave of Samuel Wilson. Who's Samuel Wilson, you ask? The meat packer from the United States Army in the War of 1812, better known as Uncle Sam. That's right, the guy Uncle Sam is based on. I'm doing grounds work in the cemetery where he's buried. How cool is that? That's very interesting. And then you can look up the story of yeah. Uncle Sam, and there you go. You know yeah. who Uncle Sam is now. That is very. That is a very. That's interesting one to grow thing. on. Let's see here. Now, see here's the other issue. So you, most of you know who've been watching this for a while. I haven't had to squint really hard to read the thing because I blew up the the chat to like this big, <laughs> um, and so it was really large. And now I didn't do that here because it would mess everything up. And now I've got to like try to really squint to read again. Oh no! Uh, do you see the green hearts though? I do see that. Clive says. I think it's Clive. I'm. I'm I can't really see. Uh, when will uh, when will be the next primetime aquatics fish room tour? Probably this summer. And so I used to do them every every quarter, It'd be the quarterly fish room tour. Then I cut it down to twice a year, and now it's yearly. And the reason for that is I don't the t the tanks my my core group of tanks don't change very much. Like the quarantine tanks, they change a lot. But the tanks that Joanna aquascapes, that kind of thing, it's like once we get our fish, we got them because we really love them and we got them because I, I, I enjoy them. And normally when I get fish, I get them young. And so that way I can maximize the amount of time I get to spend with that fish throughout its life. And for those of you who have bred fish, 
and you see them from the very first day they're born, little tiny little bitty babies, you're like, oh my gosh, little baby. And you watch them grow up and then you watch them become adults and then you watch them as they have babies themselves and then of course the, the downside, but that's really rewarding is to have something for, throughout their entire life. Well, because I'm that way, most of my tanks don't really change. And so therefore, the fish room tour that you saw a year ago, there's not gonna be a ton of differences compared to what you will see this summer with the exception of some fish have gotten bigger. And yes, we've added some fish, especially with all the stuff that we've brought in. You know, They usually make their way into some of our tanks, but that's why I've cut it down to once, once a year because I don't think the changes warrant more than one tour a year. So I think some of you would find it not as entertaining. Kevin, thank you so much for the super chat. Any picks for the Kentucky Derby? Yes. I'll take one of the horses, please. Yep. Oh, any I picks, do. huh? No? no. I, I haven't looked at the names. No. I used to I'll take the mutter. It's going to rain. You got to bet on the mutter. I, have, I don't know the first do, thing about... Do you want to hear a funny story? What? Okay, so a long time ago in a place far, far away, I went to the track with somebody and he sent me up to, to place a bet. So I had the 20 bucks or whatever. And the guy behind the counter, the ticket take, whatever, he's like, you, you want to put your money on this, this one? Well, I kept that a secret because I wanted to surprise him. I guess you don't do that if somebody behind the counter gives you a tip. You, you let everybody, let your person know. I got in trouble because I didn't share. That's a, that's a juicy tip because oh, they, okay. they're the ones booking all that. They know who's going to win. Like They're like, oh, it's a winner. My big surprise didn't go over so well. That's yep. my racehorse story. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Tom says, looking to do a species only Mbuna in a 90 gallon. Any suggestions on which single species of Mbuna to do? So you're going to just do one. One species. If that's the case, you got a 90 gallon, so that's a great size tank. And the Mbuna will actually use that height because they're crazy. They go up and down and all around. They're just a crazy bunch of super freaks. So what would I do if I'm going to do just one species? I'm going to do something like Pseudotrophia psilosi. And the reason I would pick or the Msobo. And the reason for that is I'm getting two different colors depending on whether they're male or female. And both of the colors are amazing. So in both cases, your females get like a really nice yellow color. And in both cases, the males get a bluer color. But with the Pseudotrophia psilosi, they get dark and light vertical blue stripes. With the Msobo, they get kind of like this blotchy light blue and dark blue, which is also really pretty. So you could do something like that. Uh, if you wanted to do something that's, and I like that because you do get the brightness, right? Where if you did yellow labs, then everything's gonna be yellow. If you did red zebras, everything's gonna be orange. If you did Pseudotrophius ACI, everything's gonna be blue with yellow tails. But that's why I like the Pseudotrophius solosi and the Msobo. Uh, those are really, really cool. And they are very active. And they're not overly aggressive. Solosi are less aggressive than, than the Msobo, but both of them would work really well in a 90. Blake wants to know, do I need CO2 for live plants? No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Unless you have uh, certain plants that, are, uh, that require higher light and CO2, a whole bunch of plants do not need CO2 or high light, like yeah. Anubias, Crips, Valsneria, uh, what? Buse. Buse. Java, Java fern, Java moss. Yeah. You got a lot of options. Lots, Lots of options. Yep. Hold on. I saw something really cool and I lost it. Oh, it's here. What would cause a low pH but a high TDS? That's a great question. I like that question. So you got a low pH, high TDS. TDS is total dissolved solids. The only thing that is going to maintain a high pH is KH, carbonate hardness, which is part of TDS, but it can actually be, in this case, what appears to be a very small part of your overall TDS. When you're measuring TDS, you're measuring all kinds of stuff. You're measuring carbonate hardness. You're measuring general hardness, which doesn't really impact pH. You're measuring nitrate that could be in the water. You're measuring phosphates and all kinds of stuff. So I, generally speaking, there are people who use TDS and they've really got, they understand their water chemistry enough to know what's happening when their TDS is going up and down and they know what component is, 
increasing or decreasing that. I would say for most people, using TDS might not be as valuable. What I would rather know about my water parameters as it pertains to pH, obviously I want to know my pH, I want to know ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. Those last three, especially the other ones, ammonia, nitrite, once your tank is established, I don't worry about those unless there's an issue. Nitrate, I stop worrying about it once, once my tank is established and I have also developed a water change plan that is consistent and then I, as long as I'm not adding a bunch of new fish, I know, okay, for the most part, if I test it once every couple months, I'm down, you know, I might go as high as 20, 25 parts per million upon water change, goes down to 10 and then slowly builds back up to 20 before the next water change. What you really want to know is, okay, what's my pH, my GH, and my KH? Because it's that KH, the carbonate hardness that buffers your water. That's what's going to give you stability in your pH. Normally, generally speaking, the higher your carbonate hardness is, your pH is probably going to be buffered higher as well. Now, there are ways to raise KH and therefore increase pH. But what I will also say is if your fish are doing fine, now, whatever your water parameters are, if you measure your GH and KH and pH, and so let's say you said your pH is low. Let's just say it's a six and a half. I don't know what it is, but let's just say it was a six two to six five. Your GH might be, it could be 15, 20 degrees, and your KH is only three or four. And you've got these water parameters, and while they're not ideal for things like guppies and goldfish and most African, you know, African cichlids from the Great Lakes, you do have some decent water parameters for most community type fish. And so if you're not having an issue, I would say don't stress about it. But what you do want to make sure of if you've got a low KH is that your pH is stable. All right. And so if it is a 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, somewhere in there, that it's basically staying that way all week long. And it's not a situation where, oh, my TDS is going up because I've got more and more nitrate in the tank. And then that is creating an acidic environment, which is actually changing my pH over the course of a week from like seven down to six, and you're constantly getting that fluctuation, that could create some stress. And you want to try to avoid that. What you got there? Oh, you my turn? Are messing around? No. Yeah, but you were, you were off your game. You were clearly not well, paying attention. Um, uh, there was a question regarding uh, Nubius, and this is from Boss. My Nubius has gone yellow. Some have a lot of green spot algae on them. Well, um, yellow Nubius is usually a deficiency of some sort. Um, but, al com but also with green spot algae, usually when my Nubius get a lot of algae is because they, uh, the light's too bright. Um, thoughts? Well, the green hair, or, sorry, the green spot algae is relatively easy to deal with. Again, mystery snails, otosynclus, if you've got the water parameters for them, clown plecos, will all deal with the green spot algae. So you don't, that's, that's not a huge deal. I mean, you can go in there and just kind of scrape it off with your thumb gently. Um, you could, again, Anubius is a slow growing plant. And so if you want it, and it's generally not going to be a root feeder. And so if you want to add a little bit of liquid fertilizer, I would add maybe half the recommended dosage, especially if your tank is lightly planted, maybe even a quarter of the recommended dosage. You know, if you're using like the, the easy green type stuff, right? You just, instead of squirting in a whole squirt for 10 gallons, maybe it's like, well, I've got a 20 gallon, just put a half a squirt in there for 20 and then see if that uh, has an impact because you, what you don't want is you don't want to be like oh okay well my slow growing Anubias I put in way too much liquid fertilizer and now what I'm getting is you know some algae and stuff and now we've got an even you know because you already talked about the green spot now you're getting green hair algae or something else that's making it even a bigger problem Jennifer says I have a pH of five and a half no measurable KH or GH and tap don't want to chase pH what can I keep at five and a half, that's pretty stinking low. Um, there are, I mean, I'm thinking like Ultim Angels. I mean, you'd have to have a big tank for Ultim Angels, a really big tank. Um, Discus probably wouldn't mind that pH. Uh, there are some quarry cats out there. I don't remember the species, but there are some quarry cats that go that low. There are some really nice high-end plecos that will go that low. Again, for all of these things I'm mentioning, though, as long as it's stable, Right, you don't want to have a pH of five and a half that's even crashing lower, but there, I mean, you do have some options out there. I 
for me, if I had a pH that low and you said no measurable KH or GH, I might want to put some aragonite or maybe some, I really like the Carib Sea African Cichlid Mix. You don't have to put the entire, you don't have to put that all in for like your complete substrate, but it wouldn't be bad to have it in a large filter bag or maybe it has a base layer for your substrate. Uh, you could try adding, you know, we use a flagstone and a lot of our tanks, it has almost no impact on our water parameters because our water is already fairly hard with a relatively high pH, but a little bit of flagstone. If you're going to do any of this, what I always recommend is anytime you're going to add something that you think might impact water hardness or pH, the, your best bet is to like buy one of those cheap 27 gallon black totes with like the yellow lid, the hard plastic ones, throw an air stone in there, Put the you know measure your water if it's saying five and a half pH you know maybe it's a couple degrees on your GH and KH. Put a put a base layer of African Sea, African Sea, <laughs> Carib Sea African Cichlid mix in there and say okay wait a few days. What's it doing in my water parameters? Um, it's not going to give you an exact replica of what's going to happen in a tank because your fish are going to be producing waste and that's going to have an impact on your pH as well. But at least you'll know oh hey if I do this if I add five pounds of the African cichlid mix to a 27 gallon tote, my pH went from a five and a half to a six and a half and it stayed stable for a month. So that might be a better way to go because five and a half is, it, it's kind of low. And a lot of the stuff that you would keep at five and a half would also do well at six and a half. And then because you add that substrate, you might get some more stability too because when you're saying that your KH is low and it's a pH of five and a half, I mean, you if you start getting a lot of organic compounds in there, you could drop it even lower, and that could be bad. There was... Oh. Did I find it? Yes. Okay. Okay. You got it? This is from, yeah, Tampa Fish Gents. Do you have tips for keeping buse? I usually have hardish water, and all my plants are doing fine, but my buse in the tank has kind of melted really bad. It's a 20 long planted. Um, we have hard water too, and the buse does just fine here. Yeah. Um, sometimes it will convert to being submerged in water, so sometimes it'll melt back just kind of like a crypt will, and just give it some time. So even if you got some weird looking rhizomes, that, that's really kind of all that's left it quite possibly will sprout some new leaves. So just leave it in there, either floating around or attached somewhere or wedged between a couple rocks or something, and maybe it'll it'll bounce back. I've well, had that before. Melanie, that's a really good suggestion. You just got me like three more in my brain. With the low pH, low hardness, uh, wild grommies. I know you've got the samurais in there, oh, uh, chocolate yeah. grommies. Now, now you've got me really thinking. Some of the wild bettas love that 5.5 pH with really, really low um really low hardness. So there's a ton of wild beta options that a lot of people would just absolutely love to keep and they can't. So, and like I said, look at if you're, you know, if you've got the, the stomach for it and the wallet for it, some of those, sorry, just bumped the whole table. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the more expensive plecos can enjoy that, that low pH as well. Emma says, in your opinion, what's the best way to keep and transport fish for a few days like at Aquashella? For a few days. So let's say, I'm, I'm trying to think this scenario through. You go to Aquashella and on Saturday you find some fish and you buy them. And so you, you're going to be there all weekend. And then you've got to bring them home, let's say, that's going to take you another day. So the first thing I would probably do is I would have something set up in the room. I would ideally love to have cycled filter media, right? A cycled sponge filter would be pretty awesome. Making sure that I've got a relative, whatever size container you're going to need. It doesn't necessarily have to be an aquarium. It could be like a plastic tote. I like the plastic totes, especially if they're somewhat clear. You know, you're not talking about a ton of water. But if you had a cycle sponge filter, a small air pump, preferably one that could be battery powered but also rechargeable, so that it's running off of maybe a wall outlet or a USB port while you're at the hotel. But then what's going to happen is once you have to actually transport the fish to from the hotel to home, you keep them in that plastic tote so you don't want it to be super big and super heavy. Now the battery air pump can run that 
sponge filter while you're traveling and then the only thing you have to really consider is water temperature and so it's not ideal to have it you know if you've got tropical fish and cool you know cold water so if it's me i'm probably excuse me i'm probably sacrificing a little bit at the hotel room because i'm not going to put a heater in a plastic container i might be jumping up the temperature in my hotel room to like 76 or 77 but hey our house is 77 78 so what difference does it make um and then just make sure that they stay relatively not cold on the way home so that's how i would roll with it but or if you or if you've got just a, a day you know if you're going to leave sunday evening and be back you know or leave sunday afternoon and be back sunday night you can bag them up too and you know just use fresh water dechlorinate obviously you're going to want to bring some dechlorinator you can throw them in a bag they'll be fine all day in a bag as long as you have fresh water this is from Faye of the Fay. I have almost no algae in my tank, sweet, and have lost RRF, um, RRFs, Rutella, Rotundifolia, I'm guessing, I don't know, and Cryptarva. Anubius and Java fern are doing okay though. Do you think I need more light for the other plants? For, so if it is Rutella and Cryptarva, no, I wouldn't say that you need more light. Um, but your Java fern nubius are are uh, getting their nutrients from the water column because you don't you don't uh, plant those in the substrate and Rotala and Cryparva you're planting into the substrate so my guess is maybe you haven't put any fertilizer if you're using gravel or sand that has no fertilizer um, you might want to put a couple root tabs in the substrate for them that would be that'd be my guess. Here it says, have you used Osmocote time release in the substrate as a fertilizer? Yep, we've done that. I uh, talked about it before. Osmocote Plus, double zero gel caps, scoop them up, throw them in. But for the most part, for the, the plants that we have, we don't really use root tabs after we initially set up a tank. So we'll put, add the root tabs at first, and then we let just nature do its course. Right? We don't really add a lot. Of, we don't add any root tabs after that point. And then, but again, we're keeping mostly... I guess beginner type plants with your, you know, if they're rooted, you've got your sword plants and your crypts and your jungle val, you know, stuff like that. So it's not like we're doing high light CO2. If that were the case, we'd probably have to add more nutrients to the water and possibly to the substrate. But we add them once and then just kind of let nature do its thing. Hold on, I saw. Uh oh, Emma says, I can't seem to keep red root floaters to save my life. <laughs> Has that been one of your. Issues Previously, too? I have to check because um, I got some from from Rink, and I have to see it. I put them in different tanks. I wish them all good luck. I got to check on them. They weren't really, they weren't multiplying. I'll just say that, but I haven't seen, last time I saw, they were still, still kicking it. Okay. Oh. Yo-Yo says, in your guys' experience, what fish has the best personality and bonds with its owner the best? Better. So, Hold on a second, young lady. She's mm -hmm. going over there shouting out answers. It's uh, mine. We did a video on fish with the best personalities. You'd have to search, you know, fish with the best personality in primetime aquatics, and it'll come up somewhere. Uh, there are, let's see, the one fish that I think, and it's not going to be a surprise to you, is the Oscars that we've had. By far, those were the most personable, both in terms of recognizing you when you come up to the fish tank and being goofy. And just being all out just weird. Like our Oscar, yeah, weird. when he would pout, like if he did something to the tank and he didn't like it, he would lay on his side. The first time I saw him, I'm like, oh my gosh, my fish is going to die. And he would just do that sometimes. And he'd get up and be like, what? What is your problem? I'm fine. You know, like, give me some food. Uh, really, I mean, he got to the point where I would put the big food sticks in the North Fin food sticks and I would almost like drop them in his mouth, but he wouldn't go crazy like try, you know, like grab my fingers or anything so it's kind of almost like i could hand feed them so that was a really cool fish obviously our max and ruby i was gonna i was waiting right yeah. the, the midas cichlid we had a midas cichlid pair now they were oh. they were their personalities were different they were not f necessarily friendly i wouldn't call them like the oscars is goofy is friendly those fish were personable like they knew you they got excited when it was time to eat but there was always this part of them when you looked at well, so much more so the male where he'd be like you know what 
if I didn't have to stay in this water, I might come out and punch you in the face just because I can. <laughs> I mean, there was always that attitude about him where he's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to punch you in the vibe. face. Yeah. Uh, but we still have Ruby, the female, and she's doing so great. Sweet. Very, very personable she's fish. She's a water so puppy. A lot of the large South American cichlids have really nice personalities. You mentioned the betta. Some of them can have really great personalities. If you're looking for something that, well, this isn't even a common fish, but it's a smaller fish, the volcano tetras that we have, those are surprisingly personable for a tetra. I generally don't find tetras to be like personable, like, hey, what's going on? But these fish are very personable. Uh, anything else that, um, clown loaches. I think clown loaches are very personable. They get excited. Big, we've they're got so a big silly. group of them in our 150. They're so cute. And when, it, when it's time to eat, they're all like, hey, man, what's going on? How are you doing? But it's safe to say a lot of your larger South and Central American fish are crazy very personable flower horns a lot of people love them for the same reason uh let's see oh there was a question i'm trying to find it um about getting uh fragile plants dug up by quarry cats mm. that can happen what i like to do is use um i have a the small scape um planting hack micro sword planting hack and what i do is i take just a cheap comb just go to the dollar store or whatever and get a comb and cut it into little sections. So it's got, it's basically like a little miniature landscaping stable. And you just take the roots and just kind of pin it down into the substrate. Works great for those little, and I would consider microsword very fragile because they're always popping up. But that works even for sand, because I mm -hmm. use sand. And I think you did a video on that too, right? On the small scape? Yeah, that's what you said. Channel. Well, I, you said it was a small scape hack, but I don't know if people no, realize. No, but I said it's a video of the small scape planting hack. Oh. Microsword. Microsword. Pardon me. I was reading things. Quite all right. Um, Roberto says, my Tanganyikan 300 tank contains some Valsneria plants from a few weeks. Do you think I can fertilize a bit? Sorry for my English, but I'm Italian. Hey, glad you're here. Uh, so fertilizer i can just tell you what we would what we do at the val and usually when we bring when I, when i get new val i will f the trick that i learned from somebody one of our fish clubs a long time ago because we were having a hard time just when we'd bring the val home we'd plant it and then it would just melt and very rarely ever come back and then somebody said hey when you get the valve, throw it in your tank, just float it. And when it starts sending out the runners, you know that it's kind of adjusted to your water and then start planting those runners and you'll have better luck. And sure enough, we never had an issue with it again. Now your question about whether or not you need to add fertilizer. I, again, this for us, we don't. I mean, we've got, <laughs> oh my gosh, it because this thing's not showing any green. You might not even be able to see the plants. There's corks, is this corkscrew valve? Yeah. Or Italian corkscrew valve, val, this is Italian valve. We've got it in almost all of our tanks and I don't add anything to the tank. Now, if I'm first setting the tank up, yes, I will put in root tabs, but I don't use liquid fertilizer, not for this because it's mostly just sending out roots everywhere. So I, I might put some root tabs around the tank, but then for the most part, I just leave it alone. Like these tanks have not seen any fertilizer. And of course you're looking at them like, Oh, but all your plants are dead. No, the lighting is messed up. The color balance is messed up. But all these tanks back here, we didn't, we, what are they probably, they've been set up for a couple of years at least. Has it been that long? And I think we put root tabs in when we first set up mm -hmm. maybe two or three and then never touched it again with any kind of fertilizer. And Val, I've found generally we haven't had to use it. Dragon, thank you so much for the sticker. The little sticker man. Aww. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cute. Michelle says, where did it go? Uh, sad thing is I lost both of my red-spotted gobies I got from oh, that's you. That's not cool. Um, we still have some. So if you're going to be at Greenwater, let me know. And we'll figure that situation out. Mm -hmm. Gals, continuing cute. off of Emma Rose's question, what if you have a, to take a flight back, but you want to, uh, want to bring home fish? So first of all, you can do that. And um, one of the things, we talk about this often in some of our fish clubs, one of the things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to print out the TSA guidelines, which clearly state that you are allowed to transport fish on a flight, right? Because some TSA agents get a little bit confused about the rules. And so if you just have that ready, if they start giving you a hard time, like, no, these are the rules. I can bring them back as long as they're in a clear bag and the bag is sealed. And so just follow those rules. You should have a problem. You are going to want to bag them at that point. And so if you buy the fish, make sure you bag them. Um, and then uh, people just carry them on but make sure you have the rules printed out ahead of time. Obviously, 
with that particular case, you're going to want to bag them right before you getting ready to head out the door from the hotel. And they'll be fine. You know, when when we do our swaps, we bag fish. We start bagging at around 3.30 in the morning. Like in the case of Quad City swap, we have to drive. That swap doesn't even start until noon. So they've already been in a bag for, in some cases, close to eight hours. Then people buy them. By the time they get them home, it might be 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they've been in a bag for 12 hours. And it's extraordinarily rare that we ever have an issue. So, or anybody has an issue. So, and that's really common, like all the swaps and stuff. I mean, there are a lot of people who bag up fish the day before a swap. So they'll bag them on like a Saturday afternoon and then the swap is a Sunday morning and then they go all day, all day Sunday and you know, after being in a bag. And then, you know, you think about people who ship fish, same thing. Yeah. They're in a bag for over a day. The big thing is making sure that the water that you put them in is fresh water, right? Dechlorinated fresh water. From Sweet Pea, I have a green neon tetra that has great coloring, but its stomach is shrunken. Oh, and it swims at a 45 degree angle. What is going on with it? And can I do anything to help it? It's always, I mean, to say 100%, you know, what it is, that that can be tough, right? I mean, normally with a, a, a shrunken stomach, you're assuming that there's some kind of internal parasite. Now, here, here's the thing that you have to consider, right? So it's one green neon. Okay, what you have to consider, and the, only you can answer this question. There is no, you have to do it this way or, you know, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> the question is, for that one green neon, how much money do you want to spend? Because most likely, if it's got a shrunken stomach, there could be some type of internal parasite, in which case my go-to meds for that is a combo. It's Expel-P and Paracleanse. Um, when I do those in combination, a lot of times that takes care of the issue. That combination includes, I believe it's erythromycin and labamisole. I can never remember which one is which, but it's that combination. And it works pretty well. So the question you have to ask yourself is after buying those two medications and probably spending close to somewhere between, I don't know, 30, 40 bucks on all those meds for that one fish, is it worth it for you? Right, and you have to be able to answer that question. For some people, it's like, yeah, that's my fish. I'm, I'm totally cool spending that kind of money. For other people, it's like, wow, you know what? I'm, I'm having a hard time justifying that expense for that one fish. Right now, if you decide that that is not the pathway that you want to take, then the humane way to euthanize fish is using clove oil. And you can do we, you can do. I don't think we have a video on it, but there are videos out there on how to use clove oil to um, euthanize fish. But those are your options, I think. And again, it's really hard to say. It, you might, and the other thing too is, you might buy those meds, and that's not the issue, right? And then you've you're down quite a bit of money, or it might be too far along where it just doesn't matter, right? That can happen too, and that's happened to us where we've had fish that got skinny, and it's like, all right, let me let's let's try this and see how it works, and it winds up not being enough. Desert fish, thank you so much for gifting five Prime Time Aquatics memberships. That's pretty darn cool. Who were the mm. lucky winners here? Tierra, and Elena, and Frock. Grave Digger, Aquatics, thank you. Really appreciate that. Thanks for doing that. Wait, there should be one more in there. Wait, hold on. And Cat, I'm sorry. You're up at the top. Almost missed it. Nice. But thank you so much. That's that was really so nice. cool. Appreciate that. Desert Fish and Kevin are so giving. That's pretty awesome. All right, let me see here. Just another human person. My American Flagfish is going into nesting mode. Awesome. And has destroyed a few of my crypts. Not awesome. As a result... Is there any way I can dissuade this behavior and or save future crips? No, they kind of do their own thing. Uh, you can have a good talk with the fish and like just kind of bring it aside and be like, yo, man, I feed you. I have loved you. I care for you. I give you a great environment. And this is how you repay me? You can see if that helps, but for the fish behavior stuff, I mean, whether they're whether it's this or they're bullying or doing something, it's very rare that you can change a fish's behavior because let's face it, their brains, they're really tiny. Even the big fish out there, they got tiny, tiny brains. And sometimes having a conversation with them or trying to do stuff, they're just like, my brain's tiny. I can't figure anything out. Leave me be. Malcolm says, do you gravel vac those tanks? These ones back here, rarely. And so these four tanks here, you occasionally decide that you want to do a water change, but it's only been once or twice. Yeah, right? I would say two or three times. Two or three times, I've never done it, or maybe I did it once. 
in two years. So these tanks, for the most part, get top offs. There's a t but but there's a ton of plants in here, very little fish, and so it works for these tanks. In our fish room, all of our tanks get water changes. They vary anywhere from 20% up to 80%, depending on the fish. Like we've got some pretty heavily stocked cichlid tanks. And those 125s, they need an 80% water change to keep our nitrates at a reasonable level. But some of our planted tanks downstairs only get about 20%. As far as gravel vacuuming goes, we gravel vac every non-planted tank. Uh, and then if it's sand, we'll do a little swirly with the gravel vac above the sand just to kind of suck stuff out. If the sand is got a large enough grain size where we can actually stick the gravel vac into that, we will. Uh, but I think it's really important for non-planted tanks to get gravel back because when you let that waste sit in the tank, you're just increasing over, you know, over time, you're just going to be increasing your nitrate levels. And so you could be doing a water change, but if you've got all that stuff in the gravel, it's going to be less than ideal. And it's also going to lead to a lot of excessive algae growth. In planted tanks, we will gravel vac around the areas where the roots are most likely not growing just because we don't want stuff building up there. So a lot of people who get algae problems they find that they really struggle with algae and um, or when they have algae problems they find that they really struggle with that because maybe they're not gravel vacuuming and they should be especially in a non-planted tank but yeah these ones no but definitely the ones downstairs yeah blake wants to know uh will i need co2 for low light plants no no nope. we have a super chat we do oh my gosh Luis, thank you so much appreciate it been having trouble with small white dust-like parasites with kubati rasboras. They look smaller than it, like dust compared to salt. Any ideas? It can have different appearances depending on the size of the fish. I've actually found that to be true. So uh, it's such a common parasite. It, that being ick, it could also be it could also be a bacterial infection where you start to see almost like that cloudy coating over the fish that's like oh, is it ick is it not there's a couple things you can do so my go-to's for that is one don't ignore it because if you're finding that on uh, all of your green kubati rasboras and you've got multiples then if you're not sure it's ick the ick x i love that medication i really do because it's something where you don't have to worry about taking out your plants. Your invertebrates are going to be relatively safe. So you could try treating it with the ick X. You could try increasing the temps, you know, treat it as though it were ick. Give it a few days and see if that improves at all. If it's improving, stay with that treatment method, right? Just stay with the treatment method if it's ick. If it winds up being some type of bacterial thing, that's not going to have as big of an impact. And then if I think it's bacterial, for me, the bacterial, when fish have more of a bacterial type or even fungal infection it's more of it's not so much spots it's just this kind of general cloudy white filminess to them and then i'm switching gears and i've got my marison marison 2 combination again i always use those in combination one treats gram positive one treats gram negative microbial infections and then since i'm not doing the the smears to figure out if it's gram positive or gram negative although i i guess i could take them to school and and run the gram stain in lab. I just generally don't do that. I use those in combination. Now, keep in mind when you're using that Marison combo, if you decide to treat for bacterial infection, especially if the ICX isn't working, that's going to be a little bit tough on your cycle because that's the other nice thing about ICX is um, it doesn't tend to damage the cycle quite as much. Marison 1, 2 will sometimes do that, in which case you're probably are going to want to keep a bottle of Fritzheim 7 on hand too. Squid, thank you so much for being a member of the last three months. Best way to heal a sad-looking, finned little betta from PetSmart. I found one I want to take home. Uh, thyme, a little bit of salt, maybe one tablespoon per 10 gallons, and keep an eye on it. If it's not healing, again, then it could be a bacterial infection, and again, that Marison 1, 2 combo. Uh, also the Marison Oxy. I use that a little bit as well, especially when I'm bringing fish in. And I think there might be, like every once in a while, we'll get some fish in where the tips of their fins might be a little bit white, whether it's just due to damage, might be a little torn up. That Marison Oxy usually takes care of that inside of a week. Um, Austin says, I had a salt and pepper quarry that got fin rot and lost his whole tail fin, and I was able to nurse it back to health. I'm about to let him go back in the main tank. That's what definitely a great cool. story. That's 
That's definitely what? Cool that he was able to nerf that. Oh, I heard mm-hmm. Corey. I might have said Corey because I was <laughs> I was looking at this. That's definitely That's so corny. Cooly. Yeah. That's corny. No, that's cool. That's what I meant to say. If I said Corey, I was looking at a comment that had Corey Cat in it. Gruel. That's gruel. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have carbs in it? <laughs> Whatever, I'm getting cheese fries. Uh, Michelle says, does general cure affect the pH in a mm. tank? It won't. It doesn't. I've never had it impact our pH. I mean, we are, live in the same general area, so I don't think it, you're going to have a problem because you've got the same water as I do unless you're doing something weird. Not weird, different. Okay, let me see what we got. I feel like I'm. this whole thing jumped around a little bit. Beginner carpet pan, uh, Carpet plants. Car- carpet pants. <laughs> Beginner carpet, carpet pants. Plants, low light and no CO2. Micro sword I like, and uh, which is uh, also uh, known as, well, it's known as micro sword. It's Liliopsis brasiliensis. Or um, what was the other one that you could do? Um, but that's usually for if you have low light and, and uh, no CO2. That would be my usual um, go-to. What was the other one I was thinking of? But again, but again, keep in mind that carpeting plants with no CO2 is difficult to do. I mean, yeah, it is. Right? That's, You're going to be waiting a while, or yeah. you can just get a lot of them. <laughs> get a lot of them. There you go. Uh, Living says, can honey grommies be kept together? Cat said, yes, I agree. So there's two... Well, there's two grommies that I've kept without any issues, and there's others that people keep... Um, but right, let me let me tell you the ones that probably are not going to work if you keep them or try to mix them together. The gold, the opaline, and the blue garami, those are your standard ones that you find a lot of pet stores. They're going to get to around four and a half inches or so. Trying to keep those together usually invites problems. They're usually fairly aggressive towards one another. You can add the dwarf garami in that mix too. The dwarf, the dwarf garami will fight with those and will fight with each other usually. The ones that I have found to be peaceful, if you want to keep multiple garami, garamis, garami, in a single aquarium, are the honey garamis. In fact, we have three, and this could be cool too with the honey garamis. You have the standard reds or orange, and then there are also the yellow honey garamis. And so you can keep those together and actually have two different colors. So we have three or four and a 29 gallon, no issues there. The other one, if you're looking for something larger, is the pearl garami. And in fact, when we did the pearl garami species profile, I highlighted our 55 gallon. At the time, I think I had 15 of them in there. They don't, you might be like, wow, 15 garamis in a 55? That sounds overcrowded. First of all, it's not. They're only about four, they only get about four inches or so. Second of all, when you're thinking about stocking your aquarium and making a decision on whether or not a particular aquarium is overcrowded, also consider the activity level of your fish, right? And pearl garamis tend to not be very active. And therefore, because of that, you can tend to put them in, um, you can do 12, 13, 14, 15 in a 55 gallon. It won't look overcrowded. They just kind of sit there and be like, what's going on, man? I think I'm just going to sit here for a while and hang out by myself or with these other people. So yeah, those are the two that you could definitely do. And then I know Melanie had the samurai, but those are a little bit less common and a little bit more challenging to keep, I would say. And the chocolates as well. Uh, sparkling grammys can be kept together. You just you, you need to give them some space, though. Right. Little cuties. Yeah. Hold on a second. I saw something else pop through, and then it's I gone. lost it because... That is just what happens with our chat every once in a while. Oh, this computer is running a little bit smoother than the other one. Maybe it's because it's like 10 years newer, maybe even 12 years newer. That other one, it's laying on the floor over here, and it's been cast out. Yeah. And now I don't even know I was going to say on the floor is probably a pretty good place for it. Yeah, and now I'm not even sure like what its purpose is going to be now that it's not running live streams anymore. Right? It can't. That was really the last thing that it did for you. It was. It was the last thing. Mike, thank you so much for the super chat. Can you discuss how you make and feed Infusoria? Any other options for micro fry? I'm going to try and breed uh, the Emzul Tetra. Well, first of all, I don't make or feed it. <laughs> this is the reason why, Mike. This is the reason why I don't breed small fish. I do not breed barbs. I don't breed tetras. I don't breed rasboras. I find it's just way, way easier 
and more cost effective to bring in three, four, five hundred of these fish, quarantine them for four weeks, and then sell them at a swap and move through, cycle through, and then do something different. Um, because it's a, it takes more effort than I'm willing to put in to breed these these smaller fish, and so if I were going to even attempt to do it, I would probably just use powdered rapashi, right? The rapashi food that normally people just kind of you know, they mix into some hot water and, and boiling water and then it solidifies, you've got a gel-based food. Well, that powder is actually incredibly tiny and sometimes you can just feed that to really small fish. I know when I was in Florida, uh, I went and saw Dane's fish room and he breeds all kinds of barbs and these barbs are absolutely tiny as well. The fry are really, really minuscule and I asked him what he feeds, he's like this, this is it. So he had the, I think he had the community mix of rapashi and he would just put in very small amounts of that powder because it was i mean it's it's tiny very very tiny and that's what he was using he was getting a really really good um, yields from doing that so that's what i would do if it were me and then i know i'm pretty sure aquarium co-op has a fry food that you could consider as well so but i i wouldn't grow any anything live the only caveat to that is when i was breeding peacock gudgeons I had I, I bred thousands of those things, and those fry are really tiny, but I found they grew fast enough where they must have been picking off microorganisms from all the plants and the java moss and stuff that were in the tanks because they were well-established. But they got on live baby brine really fast, and I had exceptionally good um, survival rates breeding peacock gudgeons. But that's like the smallest fry I've ever dealt with. Most of the stuff, if I'm breeding it, it's cichlids of some type, whether it's tanganyikins or peacocks or... And bonus cichlids, live pears, uh, it's pretty much, they're, they're mostly fish that's like, okay, I can leave these guys alone. I feed them live baby brine and they're going to be good. If I got to go smaller than that on purpose, probably going to have an issue. Um, Whoop has a question for you. All right, here we go. What happens when you get scared half to death for the second time? Well, here's the funny part. It's kind of like a <laughs> exponential decay where you never quite hit oh. zero, so you still manage to stay alive. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Orion says, <laughs> what do you think about natural zero water change tanks? Oh, my gosh. Is this the big, the big debate that's going on? Is that, is that this? So I want to state from the start. I didn't get caught up in that debate. I don't know who said what, where, why, or when. I just know that there was a debate about water changes. And I will just simply say what we do and what I feel about it without knowing any of the background, because I really don't know any of the background. I just saw thumbnails flying around everywhere and live streams happening about certain things. And So, as I mentioned, these tanks back here, incredibly lightly stocked, really heavily planted. I've been topping off these tanks for over two years. She did a couple water changes that were really, quite frankly, unnecessary. She wanted to do them, but it wasn't because nitrates were being elevated because there were so many plants back there. These tanks, I could keep topping them off, and because the plants are in there, they're sucking out most of the minerals, so I'm not getting a lot of increases in any kind of hardness. I'm not getting any increases in nitrate. Barely any fish in there works great. Downstairs in the fish room, we had the 50-gallon low boy that was actually, I would say, moderately stocked, had a lot of black mollies in there. They were breeding. That tank was nearly filterless, had an air stone, was like that for years. We would do water changes in there, but they were only like 25% water changes, and that was fine. For our heavily planted tanks, especially the ones that Joanna has in the basement, they're getting about 20 to 25%. And that's because while there are plants in there, those tanks are stocked heavily enough where if we didn't do water changes, the nitrates would creep up. And so what I would say, and what I've always done, is I use nitrate concentrations to determine how much water I'm going to change. In fact, we did a video about this years ago, two or three years ago. I just type in prime time aquatics. How often do I need to change water? There's a whole video there for you. And in that video, I state the same, same thing I'm saying now, and that is I'm using my nitrate concentrations to determine how much water I have to change. If my nitrate concentrations aren't going up and my plants are remaining healthy and all my fish look fine, these things are getting top-offs. If my nitrates are starting to creep up, that's a clue to me that the system 
is not going to be able to regulate itself and therefore I need to exchange the water. I need to pull some of the water out with those high nitrate concentrations and replace it with water that has zero nitrate. If you don't do that, if you allow nitrate concentrations to build over time, there's two types of nitrate poisoning. There's acute and then you have long-term nitrate poisoning. Acute nitrate poisoning means that the nitrates are extremely high and the fish are in a life-threatening situation. The science, the research for that shows, and this is mostly done with fish that are being farmed for food, acute nitrate poisoning can happen anywhere from 400 parts per million up to 900 parts per million. It might have been slightly higher or lower depending on the type of fish. That means acute, the fish are going to die. Like nitrate's too high, just like, a, like an ammonia spike, right? You just start losing tons of fish. When and I'm basing all of this off of when I did my master cert in aquaculture and fish health, when I was working with and talking with what I would consider to be true experts in the field, right? People who were managing massively huge public aquariums, people who were managing fish farms and natural systems. And the person who taught my parasites class was Ed Nova. He wrote the seminal textbook on fish parasites, right? Like the, the textbook. So I'm not talking about bro science here. I'm not talking about, oh, I've kept fish, and I've kept fish for well over, what, 46 years. Um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who, if they mess up, everything is ruined. Like they've destroyed millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of either fish stock for food or a public aquarium. So based on all of that, what I can tell you is they're doing water changes if the water parameters are not capable of self-regulation. And in most cases, they're not in a closed system. In a closed system, we're doing something very unnatural. We are almost always, even in lightly stocked tanks, stocking our tanks higher than what you would find in nature. In nature, we have feedback mechanisms that often don't exist in a closed system. Yes, you can set up certain types of media and they will suck out some nitrate and complete the nitrogen cycle, the denitrification process. Can that happen? Yes. Can you get a lot of plants that will suck out some nitrates? Absolutely, that's what's happening here. But in our tanks, what happens is if I don't do water changes, those nitrates are going to build. And so the second form of nitrate poisoning is more of a, is a long-term systemic issue. That can happen when you start getting 60, 80, 100 parts per million, right? So it's not as much as acute. You know, your fish, I'm not saying your fish are going to just boom, dead. They're, they're gone. What I am saying is over time, that's going to create enough stress in that living system where the immune system starts to not function. Because one of the first things that happens when, and I think we kind of know this intuitively, when you're stressed out, a lot of people are prone to getting sick. It's like, oh my gosh, I just got this cold. I've been stressed for the last few days or, or last few weeks. And now I'm getting sick more often. It's the same thing with our fish. Stress is one of the number one things that can cause physiological systems to break down. And so when you have high, nitrate, high nitrates in your tank consistently, that's going to cause stress, that's going to weaken immune systems, that's going to shorten the life of your fish, it's going to make them more prone to disease, and it's going to make them more prone to transferring disease to other fish. So that was a long-winded answer. Uh, the bottom line is I'm trying to keep my nitrates at around 20 parts per million or less in non-planted tanks. I will let that number go slightly higher in planted tanks, but that's generally speaking, what we try to do. Ready? Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Ken. Uh, wait. I just lost it. Where'd you go, Ken? Hold on. I want to answer this one. Sure. William says, Jason, you were right. I don't quarantine a... I don't. I didn't quarantine a new angel, and it almost wiped out my tank. Very expensive to treat. Lesson learned. Uh, yeah, and that, that's the other thing, too. Quarantine tanks, to me, are... I know it can be tough, especially if you only got one or two tanks. Like, man, now you're telling me I have to have a third tank. Yeah. If you, especially if you're getting it to a situation where you've got like, oh, I've got a 55, I've got a 75, I've got a six foot tank. You don't want to bring fish in from some source, dump them in your, your, your tank with all your other fish without quarantining them. Because if you've got a problem, my gosh, is that a pain, right? First of all, you got those larger volumes. And so we talked about how expensive meds are. It's a heck of a lot easier just to treat a 10 gallon. You, you take cycled media from your existing tank, set up your tank. It doesn't have to be running all the time. Just get your tank running. Oh, I'm going to go buy fish the day before, get that thing running, get the filter running. 
grab some cycled media from an established tank, get your water up to temperature, make sure it's dechlorinated, boom, your quarantine fish go in there. I know quarantining fish for four weeks is kind of a pain. It's like, wow, that seems excessive. Again, I learned these things from the people I trust the most, and those are the people who, if something goes wrong, it's going to cost them an insane amount of money. They can't have things go wrong. And so I follow that path, uh, follow those suggestions, and that's why I quarantine for four weeks. Because And we've had this here in the fish room. I get, we're bringing in thousands of fish almost every month, and I've had this happen where the fish look great for the first seven days, and then all of a sudden there's something that's off, right? It can happen. And not only that, sometimes the fish may look okay but they might be carrying something where they're fine, but then you put them in your tank and your other fish wind up with a problem. And so that four-week time allows them to fully clear any other types of things that they've brought in just on their own. So, All right, I found the question. Okay. It's from Ken. Working on a 10-gallon project, hoping to do a betta and a group of amano shrimp. After the tanks are, set, are cycled, which should I introduce first? I would do the amino shrimp first, but I would also say there's no guarantee that even if you do that, the bed is going to leave them alone. Some people don't have a problem, yeah. right? Um, some people say, hey, I've, I've had betta, bettas and shrimp together and uh, not usually an issue. But there have been enough people who have said, yeah, I put a betta in with my shrimp and bye bye that shrimp. was a really expensive lesson to learn. Part of that depends on the betta. For us, we don't mix them. So we, we don't mix shrimp and bettas. I've seen enough bettas in my life where they're just like, yeah, this is probably not the best. Now, we do mix bettas and mystery snails all the time. And some people say, hey, don't do that. But we've done it every single time. We've probably done it 30 times. And we've gone 30 for 30. So in terms of not having an issue. Mm -hmm. But in a mono, the other thing, too, about a mono shrimp is they're not cheap. They're not easy to find. At least around our area, they're they're a little bit harder to find. So I'd hate for you to spend four or five, six bucks, I don't know what they are in your area, but around here they could easily run that much each. And then you put in half a dozen only to find them no longer with you after a while. Yeah, and a mono's gonna be kinda out and about more than the regular uh, neocaridina, what you think? So they're not really gonna be hiding as much, I you know, know, like if you give the them same. a lot of cover. Yeah. They're always gonna be working. I think they're about the same, but still it could be it could be tough. Uh let's see here. Kat said, Joanna, what was the favorite pen you showed in today's video? It looked similar <laughs> to my own favorite pen. It's nothing fancy. It's just it's just my favorite. It is the Papermate Wright Brothers. We are not sponsored by Papermate, and we did not get paid Paper, to say that. Papermate yeah. does not know me. But, yeah. yeah, I just really like it. It's just, it's very squared off. It's a decent pen. It, the, the cap generally stays on pretty yeah. good, you know, on here. And it's That's just it's smooth writing. Yeah. So it's the same. Um, really? Yeah. It's your favorite pen, too? It's crazy. Oh, my gosh. We're pen buddies. Holy cow. All right. We have That's gone awesome. a little bit <laughs> over our normal time. So I think we're going we're gonna to call it an evening here. Um, just want to say, once again, thank you to all the people with the super chats and the stickers and all the new members and for Desert Fish and for Kevin and for bringing in all those, those new people. Hope you enjoy the experience. We'll have the members video out tomorrow. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize again. We do the best we can. Uh, certainly come back next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. We will be back. We'll try to answer your questions. Uh, thanks to the moderators for hanging out and, and helping with everything. Again, we got the cool new shirts on the website, primetimeaquatics.com. Whether you're a fish wrangler or a shrimp wrangler or someone who loves Anubias, we have it all for you. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.